Let me pray real quick. Jesus, you are good. You are worthy to be praised, Lord. We love you. We love you. Help us tune in, Lord, to your word, to who you are, what you have for us. There's so many things fighting for our attention, Lord. But for the next little bit, Lord, we wanna hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I actually even thought of that. I was like, should I even preach this morning? Because God is in the house. And I want you to hear me say this from the start. There's nothing that I will tell you that he can't tell you better and more clearly directly to you. Okay? I'm glad that you're here. Some of you are like, Pastor Mike, you always bring something so cool and a good word and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, that's great. But what you can read in the Bible for yourself and what God wants to tell you in your prayer time is divinely specifically to you and to your situation. And he has something to say to you. So please don't allow this to be the only word of God you get. Because it is not good. It is watered down by me, just being human. All right? He wants to have a real relationship growing, living with you. All right? Look at your neighbor and say, we're going to get fruity today. <laughs> Already you're like, that definitely wasn't of the Lord. Right? You know? So um, we, we were in this series we started uh, last week where we're talking about fruits. And um, last week I told everyone we started off by yelling out our favorite fruit. Today we're going to go a step further. So today I want to hear your second favorite fruit. All right? One, two, three. Yeah, I heard watermelon over here. All right, that's my second favorite fruit real close to, what's my first favorite fruit? You guys remember? Bananas, Bananas right? Bananas. So, um, so today we're going we're gonna to talk about fruits, but we're going to talk about a specific kind of fruit. The Bible calls it the fruit of the Spirit, okay? Fruit of the Spirit. Now, I didn't grow up in church, so I don't speak Christianese, or at least I didn't, I do now. But I remember when I first came to church, like the church and people within the church spoke this weird language I called Christianese where they referenced these weird Christian things that never made any sense to me. One of those things would be like the fruit of the spirit, right? And I'd be like, the fruit of the spirit. I don't even, have I ever eaten that? Should I eat that? Are they talking about weed? I mean, I'll just be honest. Like I, I again, I didn't grow up in the church. Some of y'all are judging me. Listen, I can look at y'all and judge y'all too. Like, no, I'm just saying, but does that make sense? Like, you, I, so, so I want to, I want this to be a place where we learn the word, and today we're gonna learn a little bit more about, and the, for the next couple of weeks, we'll learn more about what the fruit of the spirit is, and what is it? Are we supposed to eat it? Are we supposed to grow it? What are we supposed to do with it? Are we, you know, what is it? And that's what we're going to talk about starting today, okay? And um, one of the things uh, I wanna do before we jump in today is actually go back over what we went through last week, which kind of laid the foundation for what we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks. So um, we started last week by referencing Jesus and Matthew, where he says that we will recognize people by their fruits, all right? And he said, we will recognize people by their fruits. And we were like, okay, so then um, where does that take us to? The next thing we said was fruit don't lie. So if you look at a fruit, you don't look at an orange and think it's an apple, right? You don't look at an apple tree and think like, man, I'm going to get a banana from there. Why? Because fruit don't lie, okay? So whatever we produce in our lives actually tell us who we are, or at least how we're living, okay? Um, so we can say we're disciples, but what does the fruit in our lives say? We can say we love Jesus, but what does the fruit of our lives say? We can say that Jesus is Lord, but what does the fruit of our life say? Say. From there, we jumped into this other saying where, it's, where we said, um, if, if fruit is alive, then it should be growing. And then we, we talked about ourselves and we made the connection with our own spirit and said, okay, if I'm a disciple of Jesus and I'm alive in him, then I should be growing spiritually. I should, mature, I be, should be maturing as a disciple. And then if you guys remember, I talked about how we look at each other and we actually judge ourselves by what's outside. And then I showed you a plant and said, we look at a plant and we can see how healthy the plant is from the outside. But the truth is, right, the reason that plant is healthy on the outside, and then I pulled it out and I showed you the roots. And I said, it's healthy because of what's going on in the root system where nobody can see. Like what kind of root system? How, how, what is it connected to, right? And uh, if you guys remember, I even like, um, when I pulled it out, the whole room gasped. Well, not the whole room, like half of you guys were like, <gasps> you know, look at the roots. And then some of you guys were like, he's killing the plant. And um, as a matter of fact, like people like bombarded our staff with like, what happened to the plant? You know, the plant has been re like, um, uh, it's been put underground. No, I'm kidding. It's been put in the ground. Okay. It's planted uh, in a pot with wonderful soil. It's being watered. It's doing fantastic. It's on my porch. 
Um, please don't come visit the plant. But it, it, is, doing, it is doing well. Uh, the other time people gasped was when I cut off one of the limbs on the plant and I, and I was trying to make an illustration. And what I said was, look at this, it's still green. Even though it's no longer connected to the roots, it's still green. And every day I actually came and I checked on it and I looked at the limb and I said, hey, we'll look at it, what, what it looks like seven days from now. And when I came in the next day, I expected to find like a wilted you know, plant, but you know what it was? Still green and still okay. And it was a lesson to me that, hey, sometimes even when we disconnect to the root, our Lord Jesus, we can look good on the outside for a little while. We can pass off as in like, hey, I'm good. I'm still doing all right for a little while. I have the limb here. You guys ready to see it? Remember before it was like, I'm here. Here it is. Right? And, and here's the sad part, right? It's not just that it looks like this. I even tried to open it this morning and like pieces were breaking off. And I was like, I don't even know how to make this look good. But um, I might not know how to make this look good, but here's the truth. In the room this size, there's a plenty of disciples in this room that aren't connected with Jesus that look like this spiritually, but you sure put on some nice clothes on the outside. You sure are walking around holding your stuff up going, no, I'm, I'm still good. Here's the thing, though. You can look good on Sunday, but if you're living like this the rest of the week, this is not what God died for you to live like. Like, this isn't the life we should be living. He has joy and peace and purpose and so many different things for our lives, and, um, but it requires us being connected to the roots, right, to the vine, the one that gives us life, which is Jesus. And if we want to produce good fruit in our lives, where we ultimately landed last week was we need to be connected to the true vine, which is Jesus, right, which is Jesus. So that brings us to today. Today, or actually for the next few weeks, we're going to look real closely at what the Bible calls the fruit of the Spirit. We're actually gonna take a couple of them, or today we're gonna do four. Um, next week we'll do, I think, two or three, and then the next week we'll do the last few. But we'll just take a few of them at a time, and we're gonna dive in and really see what these fruit look like, what, what, what they're supposed to look like in our lives, how they function, and then we're gonna try to apply them or at least check to see, are we producing this fruit in our lives? All right, you guys ready? All right. These are the fruits that our lives are supposed to be made of, all right, that we're supposed to be producing. They come from Galatians 5, verses 22 through 25. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and my favorite, self-control. And then it says this, there is no law against these things. Those who belong to Jesus Christ. Who here says they belong to Jesus Christ? All right, this is talking specifically to you. Okay, ready? Those who belong to Jesus Christ have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. And since we're living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Now, if you, read, if you read the last sentence, since we're living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. And then you go back to the first verse I read. It says this, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. You see how those two things are connected? These are the things that we should be producing that if somebody were to look at our lives, they see on the branches that are our lives. So let's start by doing what we did last week and give ourselves a little self-checkup, all right? We call ourselves disciples, a lot of us in this room. Let's see if we're healthy, life-producing, good fruit-making disciples. So I'm gonna say the fruit, and I want you to just check your stuff. Check your life. Think about this past week, how you responded when somebody cut you off. You're like, oh. <laughs> how you responded when um, you had that buggy full of groceries and you walked up and Publix only had one grocery checkout person, right? Like how did you respond to every day, good and bad things, and did you see these fruit? You ready? Love. How about joy? How about patience? Here's one we don't talk about often. How about just kindness, goodness, 
faithfulness. How about gentleness? And then my favorite. How many of, you, how many of us saw self-control being produced in our life on display? Now, if you're anything like me, you hear that list, you do that self-check, and there's some you're like, got that one. But then there's other ones you're like, nope. <laughs> right? Here's the deal. God doesn't want to, didn't say, hey, some of you are going to be called to this one or that one. He says, these are the fruits. We are special trees that don't only produce one fruit, but we produce the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is all of these. So we can't pull off, like, I, mean, I love the excuse that someone gives, well, I'm just not made that way. No, 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 the one that made you says you were. Like, you can't be like, man, I am, I am, my wife is so gentle and so, like, nice and patient, but my goodness, when it comes to this one, you never see it. Like, that doesn't work. That means she's unhealthy, right? If I said, like, hey, man, I have, man, I am, I am, I am kind, and you guys are like, that, you're sure you'll pick that one. <laughs> All right, let me change that one. All right, I have joy, right? I love, but I, man, I just, I have no patience. Okay, you're unhealthy, Mike. That's the response. You're, you're, you got, you, there, there's, a, there's a part of you that you haven't given to the Lord, right? That, that, that needs to be given to the Lord. Now, he, the question I asked you was this. Are people seeing this in your life, right? Isn't that what I said? Are people seeing this in your life? And maybe you're asking like, why do people see, need to see my fruit? Okay, well, maybe we should say that differently. <laughs> That's a little weird. <laughs> maybe you're thinking, why do people need to see my religion? Like, why do people need to see, um, I wanna keep my religion private, right? Anybody ever heard somebody say that? Here's the problem with keeping your religion or, or who you love or who you serve private. The problem is this. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before men that they may, what's that word? See your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And what are your good deeds? Can I tell you what your good deeds are? Love, joy, patience, kindness, Goodness, it's the fruit of the Spirit on display, right, in your life, through your life, and onto other people. So today we're going to go over the first four, so we can get a clear, defin definitive definition, uh, just a good picture of what each fruit is, and then we can apply it to our lives and work on it. Sound good? I'm going to use fruit, that's why they're up here, um, to help us remember, so that when you see those fruit, you hopefully think of the fruit of the Spirit. So um, we're going to start with the apple first, all right? We'll start... Not this apple. We'll use this apple. All right, we're gonna start with this apple first. Um, let me ask you this. What's at the middle of every single apple? The core, right? The core. Um, who likes apples? Who eats apples? Who are the people that eat the core of the apple? Keep your hand raised. Look in disgust at these people. Like this is, <laughs> you've already eaten most of the apple. Let the last part go. Like it's just one more bite. Let it go, okay? All right, I'm just kidding. All right, um, so every apple has a core, right? There's a core to every apple. Let me tell you this. Love has to be at the core of everything we do. Everything we do, how we talk, how we act, our attitude, everything we say and do at the core of it should be this thing called love, especially if we say we belong to Jesus, especially if we call ourselves disciples and say that we know and live for God. As a matter of fact, the Bible goes even further and says this, if you know God, then you better have love at the core because the truth is, if you don't find love at the core of who you say you are and what you do, then the truth is you really don't know God. And you're like, man, Pastor Michael, that's harsh. Listen to what the Bible says. John, 1 John 4, 8, whoever does not love does not know God because God is Love, you can interchange those two words. According to this scripture, God is love. And, and God, or love, has to be at the core of who we say we are, which means it has to come out of us in our words, it has to come out in our actions, it has to come out in the attitude with which we live and how we respond to everyday life. Listen to Jesus in John 13, 34. He says, a new command, everybody say command, 
a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Notice he didn't say ask. Notice he didn't say I suggest. No, he didn't say I hope. He said I command. Let me give, can I go a little bit deep here, just take a quick time out? Okay, when, when the world, when sin came into the world, right, and everything happened, one of the things that happened was man's heart, rather than allowing Lord, the Lord, Jesus to be, or God to be Lord, right, Father God, Lord, he decided to be his own Lord and make his own decisions, which means that from then on, we're just rebellious. There's something in us that doesn't like anything or anyone to Lord over us. It's why when I pull into Disney World, and I'm gonna get the second best parking spot in the whole park right at the front. If the guy does this, I'm like, why do I gotta park there? Maybe I wanna park in the back. Which I don't. That's the best parking spot. But simply because someone else is telling me what to do, I'm like, mm, you ain't to bother me. Okay, that, that's the rebellious spirit that is in us because we live in a broken world. And, okay, watch this, how it goes further. Jesus is commanding us to love one another. There's something in you that's like, I can love some people, but I don't want to love. I want to choose who I love. That's why he doesn't ask us. He commands us, which will clearly tell you if he's really Lord of your life or you just call him Lord. Because there's a big difference between calling somebody Lord and actually having them Lord over you and giving them the ability to command you and tell you what to do. Now here's, here, let's time back in. 1 John 3.18 says this, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and truth. Saying I love you, and I showed you last week when I told you about my wife and screaming at her, if I scream I love you at her, it's not gonna do anything, right? It has to be followed up with real actions, a real attitude, right? Real truth. How do we know that God loves us? Not because he said it, but because he loves us, right? He came and he gave his life for us. Jesus didn't say, I love you and walk away. Jesus said, I love you. Now watch me show you with action and truth. There's too many disciples and too many of us that are walking around and saying we love people, but our actions and truth don't follow that up. This fruit is not at the core of who we really are, right? We don't see it. Listen to 1 Corinthians 13 to show you how important love is, even with action, even when you do the right thing, the good thing, if, it's not, if love is not at the core of it, it's still worth nothing. Listen to this. If I speak with human eloquence and angelic ecstasy, but don't love, I'm nothing but the creaking of a rusty gate. If I, if I speak God's word with power, revealing all his mysteries and making everything plain as day, and if I have faith that says to a mountain, jump, and it jumps, but I don't love, I'm nothing. If I give everything to, that I own to the poor and even go to be at the stake and burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, or what I believe, or even what I do, I'm bankrupt without what? Love has to be at the core. There's a reason why it's the first fruit written on this list. It has to be at the core of everything we say, however we think, and whatever we do. We need to love like Jesus loved. Love is an action based on what? On purposeful decisions, not a feeling. Do feelings accompany love? Yeah. Both good and bad feelings, to be honest. But those feelings aren't love. Love is a purposeful decision that has action that goes behind it, all right? Everything we do at its core must have love. Who wants this apple? Anybody? Awesome, I see you right there. Good catch. Did he really just throw an apple in the sanctuary? All right, the second one we're going to talk about is this one, all right? It's joy. Everybody say joy. joy. Joy is like an orange, all right? How is joy like an orange, Pastor Mike? What is the vitamin that joy provides? C. All right, C. It's known for vitamin C, okay? And according to WebMD, not only does it provide an enormous amount of vitamin C, it actually will give you an energy boost, right? 
instantly, but then also it's now known to be found out that it'll give you like an energy uh, boost, but also an, uh, like a like sustained energy. L- lasts longer than coffee. Hint, hint for some of y'all. All right. It, 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 I'm, not, I'm not making that up. I don't drink coffee, but I'm still not making that up, all right? Okay, it gives you sustained energy. Joy is like an orange. Now watch this. When you walk in joy, it will not only energize you, right? Not only give you an energy boost, but it'll actually energize you and sustain you and give energy to those around you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? When you're walking through something, but all of a sudden there's something in you, like a spring that's living, right? Now, um, nobody point at anybody, but does anybody know... um, We'll call them joyless people. Anybody know one of them joyless people, right? It doesn't matter how good things are going. They seem to figure out, like, how to complain about it. They see the bad. They seem to, they hunt for the bad in every situation, right? You, you can say, man, were, were you at church Sunday, man? Worship was awesome. It was so good. And their response is like, yeah, but they didn't play my favorite song. Right? Man, did you see all the baptisms we had last week? Woo! Did you see all the water that got on the stage? (laughs) Everywhere. Right? Man, I mean, hundreds of people have responded to the gospel and have either committed or recommitted to Jesus in our services this past year. Can you believe that? Could you believe that Pastor Mike wears a baseball cap in the sanctuary? (laughs) I mean, it does not matter right? What it is, they, they find the, the, the thing to complain about. They walk into the room and you pull out the violin because it's going to be wine, wine, wine. They're going to start whining. They're going to start complaining about something. There was a guy that used to come to church here. I'm so glad he doesn't come to church here anymore. He still goes to a church. I'm happy for that. That's good. We're not the only good church. Okay, But this guy would come to me every Sunday, it felt like, with some sort of complaint, some sort of problem. It wasn't always the church. It could be a stoplight. It could be, I mean, just always came. When I'd see the guy across the room, I'd look the other way. <laughs> Do not catch eyes with that guy. It was the opposite of, you ever seen like squirrel and like, like the, oh. don't look. And if they came towards me, you can ask Darius, because I still do this sometimes, and don't think it's you, okay? It's never you. It's somebody else. But I'll look at Darius and be like, just start talking to me. Just start, t- start talking to me, bro. <laughs> I'm looking at people like, do you need prayer? Do you need- I need to pray for you right now. <laughs> right? Why? Because I don't want that person to come into my sphere of even, like, area, because they're just joyless. Suck the life out of you. Now, don't point again, even though it's positive. How many of y'all know the portion that's like somebody that's filled with joy? You know what I'm talking about? It don't matter what the situation, how bad it is, they somehow seem to make it good. They seem to see it. They don't have a glass half full. It, it feels like they walk around with the pitcher, like just, like just watering everybody's glasses, right? You just love when they're there. You love when they're around. You just, man, you just, oh. They, they walk into the room They don't even come over to you, but just because they walk in, you smile. As a matter of fact, simply by me saying, like, anybody know somebody like that that's full of joy? The whole room went from like, ha, ha, ha. (laughs) Why? Because you just started thinking about these people, right? People that just, um, they just make us better, right? Somehow they just make the day better. It's like a like a boost of energy, right? Why? Because it's joy. Now, now watch this, watch this, watch this. Um, anybody ever re- recognize that when you have joy, or even if one of these people that have joy come into your life, it just feels easier. Whatever the thing is you're going through. Like, it's almost like you're, it's easier to carry, like you're stronger because of it. Well, I'm gonna tell you why. Because you're stronger, you actually have more strength. Listen to what the Bible says in Nehemiah 8.10. The joy of the Lord is your You actually have more strength to carry the things you're carrying, to walk through the life that you're walking through, to be a Joseph and allow God to do some things in your life that ultimately end up like being his glory for everyone to see when you have the fruit of joy in your life. 
And I love that joy is not only, not, only, not only does it affect you, but I love that it affects other people. It's actually contagious. It's like when, um, you, ever been, you ever been in a room where someone else is laughing and it causes you to start laughing? And you kind of know what they're laughing about, but you're not 100% sure. But all you know is that they, because they're laughing, you can't stop laughing. You start making them say, like, I don't know why. I can't stop laughing. You just, you know, I mean, it's hurting and you can't stop. Like, that joy does the same kind of thing. As a matter of fact, like, even just smiling, right? Tomorrow, when you walk around, we're conditioned to not look people in the face. Instead, do the opposite. Look people in the face and just give them drive-by smiles. Watch how many people just smile back. Not only will they smile back, you keep going, and they're like, did I know that person? I'm gonna tell you why they say that, because we've been conditioned to only smile at the people that look like us, that are in our circles like us, that we know and we care about. Can I tell you that God didn't call us to be salt to the people we know and love the people we know. He said for us to be the salt of the earth, and that means to love everybody. Now, laughing and smiling are not joy. They're different things, but they are an outward expression of an inward thing called joy that you should have, that should be on display for others to see, right? James 1, 2 and 3 says this, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. See, here's the deal. Happiness is a feeling that comes and goes depending on on what is going on in your life. Joy is something that you can have simply because you're in a deep and a real relationship with the one that created you, Jesus. And because you have that, and you know you have Jesus, then guess what? Even the trials you walk through no longer have the effect they had before because you have joy. You can even have what he, he takes it to another level, pure joy. As a matter of fact, you start reading that scripture and you're like, consider it pure joy. And I'm like, ooh, something good is coming. And then the next thing it says is whenever you face trials and you're like, wah, wah, like, whoa, what do you mean have joy when this happens? Why? Because your joy is not dependent on what you're going through. Your joy is dependent on who you're connected to. The vine, remember how important that was? The vine that you're connected with. And here's the deal. It's not telling you that you have to have it. It's telling you that you could have joy in those times if you choose to be connected to the one that is your joy, that gives you strength. Amen? Amen. So what I'm trying to say with this fruit is simple. Regardless of the situation you're in, regardless of the season you're walking through, we can have joy if we choose to connect to Jesus. Do you have the fruit of joy on the branches of your tree? Are you producing that? Are you seeing that is the question, all right? That's that one. All right, here's the next one. Um, Love, joy. The next one is peace. Everybody say peace. Peace. All right, for peace, we'll use the the pineapple. Peace. Who wants an orange? I didn't even throw this out there. There you go, bro. People are like, ooh, the next one's gonna be a good one. (laughs) And it is football season, so come on. Now, all right, um, did I hear Tua? No, I'm sorry. Um, uh, do you guys know that there's something you could do to make pineapples taste better? Okay, watch this. So in, in Hawaiians will tell you um, that um, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to cut the stem off and then you put the pineapple upside down and you sit it on your counter or you sit it somewhere for like two hours. And what happens is because the pineapple sits like this, um, all its juices, all the sweet juices stay on the bottom. But when you flip it, you allow all the juices to actually slowly make its way through the entire fruit, which is why when you eat pineapple, sometimes you're like, ooh, this piece is super sweet. And the next one you're like, that tastes bland. It's because they never flipped it, and you're eating a piece from up here versus a piece from down here. Oh, everybody's like, oh, genius. I know, I'm smart, or Hawaiians are smart. <laughs> In the same way that you have to turn a pineapple upside down to get it all to flow, sometimes we have to bend over backwards and turn upside down to find peace especially all over our lives, right? The good thing is this, it's not completely reliable. Like peace is not dependent on us flipping our lives completely upside down all the time. Like real peace. The kind of peace that passes understanding is the way the Bible describes it. 
John 14, 27, this is Jesus, and he says this to us. Peace I leave with you. And the second part's even better. My peace. I, what does he do with it? He gives it to us. Like peace is something we receive. Real peace. The kind of peace that passes understanding is the kind of peace that gives you. And what I mean by that is this. Peace that passes understanding means it doesn't make any sense why you have it when you have it. Like you get bad news and somehow you still have peace. Like that doesn't make any sense. I don't understand how you have that peace. Oh, because the peace I have is the kind of peace that passes understanding. It's not dependent on what's going on or what news I get or what's happening around me. I'm gonna give you some examples of of, um, the kind of peace that Jesus provides. In Matthew, a real life example. In Matthew 8, okay, Jesus um, jumped on a boat, okay? He had preached all day long and he jumps on a boat with his, uh, his guys, his disciples, and um, he's like, hey, man, guys, I want you to take me. We're here. Let's go across the, right over there. Let's go across the lake, right over to that side over there. And, um, and Jesus, he's tired. He's been preaching all day. Uh, the, what were the jobs of the disciples, some of them beforehand? They were, they were fishermen, right? So they're comfortable on a boat. So Jesus says, I'm tired. He finds a little cozy spot, and he goes to sleep. And the Bible says that they're cruising along and all of a sudden the storm kind of comes upon them. And at first it's not, not great, but it goes from bad to like worse, like real bad. And when it gets real bad, I'm talking about the wind is howling. The waves are just like crashing onto the boat, lightning, thunder. I mean, it is, it is, it is going down. And the disciples actually feel like they are going down. They, get start, they start getting panicky and they start thinking that, man, the boat's going to capsize. We're going to drown. The storm is like next level storm. So I want you to think about these guys, okay? Remember, they're fishermen, so they know. Like, they're comfortable on a boat and they are panicky. Can you see them in your mind? They're kind of running around, kind of, let, 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 listen, they're doing, they're frantic, they're scared. They're doing everything they can to survive. Man, I would wonder how many of y'all describe your life right now. Just like that. Frantic, scared, doing everything you can to survive. Watch what happens with them. One of these panicked guys goes to Jesus and wakes Jesus up. Wake up, man, we're gonna die. How could you be sleeping? In my mind, Jesus slowly gets up and he's like, you know, and they're kind of freaking out. Jesus walks to the edge of the boat and he just says this, says, peace, be still. And the waves are like, shh, Done. Everything Jesus said, every miracle he did was like, boom. In that moment, boom, everything stops. And the disciples are like, ah! <laughs> Right? Jesus looks at them and he says this, where is your faith? Where is your faith? And one of them replies, and he just looks around and he's like, who is this that even speaks to the winds and the waves and they listen. They've never seen anything like that. Never seen a miracle like that. They're like, who is this guy? Oh my, this is crazy. Some people believe that um, when Jesus asked them, where's their faith? The reason he asked was because he was asking like, why didn't you stand up and just tell the winds and waves what to do? Like, why didn't you, why didn't your faith stop all of this? We know that's not true. They had never seen anything like that, including they've never seen Jesus even do something like this. So why would that be an expectation? Okay, that's not what he was saying. When he says, where is your faith? What he's telling him is this. Guys, do you not realize that I'm on the boat with you? Do you not realize who told you to go this way to the lake, across the lake? Do you not realize that there is no storm that there's no thing that will stop you as long as I'm on your boat and you're going where I'm telling you to go. Can I tell you the same thing? That you can have peace. That on your boat, when you choose to have Jesus on your boat and in your life, and he is Lord and he is dictating where you live and helping you navigate your life, that if he's on your boat, you can have peace. Peace that passes understanding. Peace that makes you look and go, who is this guy? I mean, I know he was good. I know he was great, but really? That's what happened earlier. When I shared about my prayer for five years, I'm over there like, God, I know you're good, but really? 
Come on. Who is this guy that loves people that I love this much and that would answer? Like, come, that is the peace of God that I'm telling you that we could walk in. The peace of God can supersede anything going on in our lives. And the truth is this. The truth is you and I, if we have Jesus, should be an island of peace, like a place of refuge for even people that don't know Jesus. That when we're in the middle of the same storm, they're like, how are you standing on solid ground where I feel like I'm in a boat being tossed around? Like, how do you have peace in a world that is freaking out, in a world that is panicked, right? They will notice when you have peace and they don't, right? And you know what that does? It brings us back to that original scripture. Let them see, right? Your good deeds, why? Because if they see it, they will ultimately end up praising your father in heaven. When someone sees you having peace in the middle of the same storm they're walking through, I promise they're gonna ask you, what's going on, man? Why aren't you panicked? Why aren't you worried? And then you can all of a sudden say, no, nah, because I, I serve the, the God that's on my boat that, man, his peace passes. I have peace. I know we should be crazy right now, but I, I still have peace. Man, I know worry rose up, but guess what? I told my worry about my God, and all of a sudden now I have peace. The Bible says that Jesus has already won. That Jesus is in control. You know what that means? If he wins, you win. I win. Colossians 3.15 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. It doesn't even say for you to have it in your heart. It says it should rule in your heart. Look at your neighbor and say, and say this with a clear face, not smiling, just seriously, like you're speaking into their life. Say, you can have peace. Because I know there's some of you right now that you don't have it in your life and you'd give anything for it and you feel like you gotta pay some price and you're willing to pay a price for it. There's no price to be paid. He already paid it for you. It's about receiving it. You can have peace. Everybody say love, love. joy, joy. Peace. peace, pineapple. Pineapple. All right, no, I'm just kidding. We're not going to go the pineapple. We'll keep the pineapple here. If you want a pineapple, you can come get it after service. All right. Here's the the last one. Everybody say patience. Patience. All right. With patience, we're going to say banana. But now, here's the deal. Like, you guys know this is my favorite, but you know what I can't do? I can't pick up a banana and go, and then just start eating it. That is gross. That is grosser. That's worse than you think. That's a big bite. All right, I'm put, anybody want a banana? No, I'm just kidding. All right. Like, I just can't pick up a banana and start eating it, right? Like, I got to wait till it's... I got to wait till it's ripe. I got, not only do I have to wait till it's ripe, even after it's ripe, right? I pick it up and I'm like, okay, now I got to peel it. And if you're anything like me, like, if I'm going to take the time to peel a banana, I'm going to take the time to look at it for the little, little extra little veins and, like, pull all those things down too, right? Like, I have to have, what is it, patience, right, if I want to eat that well. Listen to me. Just like a banana, you have to have patience for it to be ripe, just because, and then you have to have patience to, and then you have to peel it. We have to, li- to live with patience. I mean, we have to allow the, go- the Lord, right, to move in our lives, and then we have to choose to peel worry and peel anger off of our lives. If you think about all the things that give you a lack of patience, <laughs> those are all things that have to do with you that being, having to like, have it and then peel it off. Like frustration. Anybody get frustrated easily? It's rarely that you're frustrated with yourself, but even then, you have to, you're going to get frustrated. If, you, if you, anybody here never gets frustrated, like you found the answer to frustration, let me know because I, I don't know the secret code, Right? What I do know is that I can get frustrated and then go, nope, nope, I gotta be patient. I gotta be patient with someone. I gotta be patient with myself. I'm I'm, I'm gonna peel this off my life so that what you see at the end is patience, right? We live in this fast-paced, drive-through society 
that doesn't allow for patience. It doesn't require it most of the time. And then tells us that we shouldn't have it. As a matter of fact, the definition of patience is calmly enduring frustration or delay. That's the definition. So, so, so we live in a world that, that says, you know what? You, you, you don't have to be patient. You, you, you know, like the, everything's fast. Everything's quick. Microwave. Like if you want to make plans, that's a good example. You want to make plans, what do you do? Like pull out your phone. Call somebody and make plans. As a matter of fact, you, should, you don't even have to talk to them. Just text them and make plans. You don't even have to send a text. That's how where we live right now. Talk to your watch and let your watch send a text to the person you didn't even talk to to make the plans for you. Like that's the kind of level we're at when it comes to our culture, when it comes to, like when I had to make plans, I remember when I was 15, I had to like pull over and find a payphone. For you young people, just so you know, they were like payphones, giant boxes that were on the street that you walked up to, not with somebody there collecting money, the payphone itself collected your money. And then I would call my friend to make plans, and I didn't call their phone because they didn't travel with the payphone. What I called was their pager, which is a little box this big. It was a beeper that would beep, and then a random number would show up in their pocket, and then they would go and find a payphone, which meant that I sat by a payphone for like 30 minutes waiting, hoping that it would ring, and that my friend would call me back so that I could then make plans. And I get an amen from anybody that's old in here. Times have changed, right? And culture has trained us to be more and more impatient. Not only has it trained us to be more impatient, here's the truth. The truth is, it tells us even, it tells us this, we, we deserve not to have to wait. You deserve not to have to wait on other people. You deserve to get what you want. You've earned it in some way. Here's the problem with the earned and deserved mentality. It looks nothing like Jesus. The example of Jesus, the only person on this planet that ha- deserves everything and has earned it all, literally comes and says, you know what? I'll be the example. Watch me serve others. Watch me put others before myself. Watch me tell you that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Like, it's not about us deserving. It's about us looking like Jesus. And to look like Jesus We have to have the fruit of patience in our lives. We have to have the fruit of patience in our lives. I'll give you two examples, quick examples of of Jesus being patient. Um, It's towards the end of his life, these examples, and he's already walked with the disciples for years and years and years. Like he has spent time teaching them and training them and eating with them, and they've seen him be patient with themselves and with others and so at this point, he knows it's the end of his life. Jesus knows he's gonna like die soon. As a matter of fact, we're gonna go to the last night of his freedom. So he knows he's about to be done and he's gonna release these guys and the gospel is gonna be on them to spread. So they have to be what? Good to go at this point. Like they should have learned what they needed to learn and they are ready. And Jesus is like, okay, I got this huge thing coming up. We know what it is, the cross. And I'm kind of stressing out a little bit, you know, and I need to go pray, get my mind right. So he asked a couple of his boys, hey, can you guys come with me, disciples, and can you guys pray with me? And Jesus goes, and he goes to a garden, and we know the story. He starts praying. Jesus is so intensely praying that his sweat is turning into blood. I mean, he is praying. And he goes back to check on the guys that are praying with him, and what are they doing? Them jokers fall asleep. Listen, if I were Jesus... I wouldn't wake them up like, hey, guys, what are you doing? I'd probably kick them. (laughs) Like, what are you? Get up. I told you how serious this was. But does Jesus act like we act? He shows impatience. He's like, hey, guys, this is serious. I need you guys to pray with me. Come on. They're like, we got you, boss. He goes. He starts praying again. He comes back, and they are. Listen, one strike, you're out with Pastor Mike sometimes. Two strikes, you, throw, you get thrown out of the stadium. I'd have been like, you out, <laughs> which is really bad. If Jesus says you're out, that's a really bad scenario, <laughs> right? But does Jesus act like that? No, he says, patience. Wake up, guys. I need you guys. I need you guys to pray. They fall asleep again, just so you know. Jesus comes back a third time, still shows them patience, because what you see next is they walk away together. Patience. 
Then we have them all together and they're in this garden again and um, the soldiers show up, Judas betrays Jesus and you have Peter. Peter's like one of his main guys. If anybody has received patience from Jesus, after walking and talking, and G Peter has a big mouth. You realize that if you read the Bible, he has received a lot of patience. So you think like this guy right here, he's gonna be like the, the, the stone that the church is built on. Like this guy knows he's gonna exude patience in the character of Jesus. And the soldiers show up and they start trying to arrest Jesus. Does Peter respond with patience and love, joy, peace? No, no, Peter pulls out a sword. He, he just starts swinging it. He cuts a guy's ear off. Jesus has to step in and be like, whoa, big fella. Jesus picks up the guy's ear. He heals the guy. Praise God. The guy's like, great. I come to arrest this guy, and this guy's healing me. You know what I'm saying? Just imagine that guy. But either way, then he looks at Peter, and does he yell at Peter? Does he scold Peter? Does he say, like, obviously I can't count on you? No, no. He shows him patience. The fruit of patience, again, over and over, shown by Jesus. Let, let me ask you this. How patient has Jesus been with you? How, how patient has he been with you? Let me take that question a step further. Have you been that patient with others? Have you been as patient with others as the patience that you've received from Jesus? James 1.19 says this, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So say it after me. Say, quick to listen, quick to listen. Slow, to speak, slow to speak, slow to get angry. I'll give it to you in one word. Patience. Patience. We're gonna, we're gonna um, stop right here, okay, for today. I've given you a lot, okay? I've given you four. Um, I want us to, like, think about these throughout the week. I want us to, to digest these. Go to the grocery store, buy these fruit, put them on your counter, and as you eat them, and, and just ask yourself, like, man, are these fruit being produced in my life? What are the things that I need to do to produce these fruit? Can, can I tell you the answer? It's connect with Jesus. It's not in your effort that you all of a sudden start producing this fruit. Like, you can't leave her and be like, I'm gonna be more patient. Nope. You're just gonna be more frustrated. But if you say, I'm gonna leave here and connect to the vine, and in my time with him, I'm gonna say, God, help me, help me, help me grow my patience, Lord. Let me remember how you've been patient with me. Let me see people the way you see them. Then you'll see the fruit of patience start showing up in your life, and the fruit of peace and the fruit of joy and all these things. All right, let's go over them real quick before we end. What's the apple represent? Love has to be at the core of everything we do. Okay, love has to be at the core of everything we do. What's the orange represent? Joy. joy. Our joy comes from Jesus. Not our circumstance, not, not what's happening around us, not the good things that happen to us. Joy comes from our connection to Jesus. What's the pineapple represent? Peace. You and I need to be an island of peace. Recognize that if we invite them onto our boat, then we can have peace regardless of what comes our way. And then the last one, what's the banana represent? Patience. Has Jesus been patient with you? Have you been, have been, you been displaying the same patience with others? All right, those, those are the four, okay? Everybody bow your heads, close your eyes. Love, joy, peace, and patience. One thing I want you to notice about all these uh, fruit of the spirit is that they're all provided by Jesus, all comes from being connected to him. He is love. It's his joy that gives us strength. It's, it's his peace that passes understanding. And it's his example of patience that shows us how to be patient. All of these fruits aren't a result of something that we do or, or, or us trying harder. They're a result of what he provides when he is the one that we're connecting to daily, consistently. 
There are fruit that show up when we're connected to the true vine. And the Bible says it, it says he is the vine and we, we're just the branches. And maybe you're here, maybe today you realize that, you know, these fruit, man, these fruit are missing in your life. Maybe you recognize that you're not connected to the vine like you should be. Maybe you don't know him as Lord and Savior. Maybe you did at one point, but you walked away and you kind of, like the limb, you've cut yourself off. Listen to me, listen to me carefully. He is not mad at you. He is not aggravated by you. He's not disappointed in you. He's actually pretty glad that you're here. As a matter of fact, he's been waiting patiently for you. He's been waiting for you to invite him back into your life. Now, I'm gonna pray a special prayer in just a moment doing just that. A prayer that says, God, I want you to forgive me of my sins and, and being disconnected to you, God. I wanna invite you to become Lord of my life. If that is a prayer you want to be a part of with me, if you want to do that, then right now I just want you to open your eyes and just look up at me. As a matter of fact, there's so many eyes and, and the lights are so bright I can't see. So would you just kind of be like, hey, that's me, Pastor Mike. I'm with you in that prayer. I see both you guys, all three of you guys. You can put your hands down once I see you so I know. I see both you guys up there, yeah. Is there anybody else? I'll look around. If I look in your direction, I see you, girly. Come on, Jesus. I see all three of you up there, yeah. I see you in the back in the shadows, come on. Just grab my attention, I see both you guys. Come on, Jesus. Is there anybody else who just don't wanna miss you? Just, just get me. Oh, I see you back there, yep. I see both the guys up there, come on. And I see you right here in the middle, on the left, yeah. And in the front, come on, Jesus. All right, cool. Let me do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray this prayer out loud and you wanna say this or something like it, you can repeat after me or just make it your own. But just know, like, you're not praying to me or nothing to do with me, man. This is between you and Jesus. And this is that first step, like saying, God, I wanna be connected to you. Now grow me. So, so say something like this. Say, Jesus, thank you for loving me, for seeing me, and especially for being patient with me. I see you now. I see you for who you are. You're the God that loves me, that came to earth, that, that gave his life on a cross and paid for my sins, that came back to life and now can forgive me of my sins. So God, that's what I'm asking for. I'm asking for your forgiveness. I haven't been connected to you, Lord. Would you help me to connect with you? Would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? Would you help me to love people the way you love me? Would you give me your joy? Fill me with your, your peace, Lord, and help me to be patient. God, I'm gonna live for you the rest of my life, and I want you to do whatever you want to do with me and in my life. I love you, Lord. I'm yours. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, come on, everybody said.